August 28, 1963, the March on Washington took place in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall. But now, how did it happen? Did somebody just come up with a good idea and say, hey, let's go march somewhere? Let's look at this in context. We must go back to April 1963. This was down in Birmingham, Alabama, and they were protesting conditions down in Birmingham, and normally, you know, it would work by having adults march. They'd be arrested, fill up the jails, it would call attention to the problem. But the people in charge down in Birmingham were pretty much aware of Dr. King's tactics, and so they started talking to jails in, in, in other vicinities, and they were like, look, if we, if we arrest X amount of people, will you be able to accommodate? Yeah, so they were able to do that, and, and folk got arrested, and nothing happened. And Doc was trying to figure out what to do. As a matter of fact, he, he um, when they were meeting, he said he had to go pray about it. And he came back dressed in his dungarees, and which meant, and it was Good Friday. And it meant that he was not going to be in his own church, but in, instead he was going to probably be in jail. And that's when he ended up writing his letter, uh, his letter from a Birmingham jail. But the idea came on the table to allow the children to march because, you know, they didn't have jobs that they could lose. So they were meeting at the churches as they would normally would, including the 16th Street Baptist Church. Those kids did not march far before they were faced with police dogs and fire hoses. Now, that could have happened to those kids and nothing be said about it. Matter of fact, people could deny it happened, say, hey, it never happened except for the fact that it was captured on film, whether it was motion picture or still photography, it was captured and those images went all around the world. And so now, you know, the United States, which, which stands for freedom and democracy, is like, okay, we get that, but how do you explain, explain what you're doing to your people? And so long story short, there were some changes that took place down in Birmingham, but Dr. King realized that they did not want to lose the initiative, so they had to do something else. He was approached about a march in Washington, D.C., and A. Philip Randolph was one of the um, coordinators of that march. He also coordinated a march in 1941 uh, to allow blacks into the military and also uh, industry, of course, uh, President Roosevelt said, oh, you don't have to march about that, and he made that possible. But um, this is the same A. Philip Randolph. Now, the morning of the march, temperature was a high of 83 degrees, there were over 250,000 people in attendance, and there were some people in charge who were concerned that 250,000 people may start rioting, and that was a concern. And um, there were many speakers on the program, and uh, one of which was the 25-year-old John Lewis, president of the Student Nonviolent non Coordinating Committee that was uh, also known as SNCC. And his speech is probably the second most recognized speech. And he had a pretty fiery speech that he was going to deliver. And, you know, the elders, they feel around all those guys, says, look, son, you can please tone your speech down. We don't want this thing to turn violent, you know. And so out of respect to them, he toned his speech down. But when you still hear his speech, he just hits the ground running. He, there's no pleasantries at the beginning. We march and, today um, for jobs and, and he, freedom. And he pretty much starts out saying something well, we to the effect of, uh, you know, we, don't, we really don't have anything to be happy about. And he goes into the reasons why. And, he, and at some point he's like, look, we want our freedom and we want our freedom now. And uh, and as 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 fiery as it was, it was a lot less than what he was going to do. Now this is the same John Lewis who you know from his days in college at least he was serving others. He was fighting for those who could not fight for themselves, and he was that way until the day he died. And the last 33 years of his life, he served in Congress. Now, I have to say, you know, somebody accused him of being a do-nothing. Let me just tell you, John Lewis did more in the first 25 years of his life than most people would do in a lifetime, and he was almost killed doing it on several occasions. And, you know, there's no doubt that he, he served people 
because he's got the track record to prove it. That's why if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, listen, uh, I want you to vote for me because I want to serve the people and they don't have a record of serving, they are not telling you the truth. Now, when Dr. King started his speech, and he's, he's like the last speaker, and, and they want him to be the unifying voice because you know, you got the big six and you've got other organizations there, and they don't always see eye to eye on, on what direction to move in. But they wanted him to be the unifying voice, and so he's the last speaker to go. Now, when he starts his speech, he starts it out by saying five, five score, score years ago. Years now, why didn't he ago. just simply say 100 years ago? or in 1863, in that symbolic. five score language ver sounds very similar to the language used by someone else uh, whose monument is behind him, Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address. And he also refers to the, the Declaration of Independence. And so what is Doc doing? He's building his argument on documents that are considered in American history to be foundational documents to the nation. And he gets on this 100 years, he's like 100 years later, the Negro still has this 100 years later, we even 100 years later. And essentially what he's saying is 100 years later, we're still dealing with this stuff that should have been dealt with. Now there's a lot of stuff that Doc says in his, in his speech, but my favorite aspect of this speech is this. Now, when he gets to the part, I have a dream. The first time he mentions his dream, he says, I still have a dream. Now, that bothered me. And I went back and I listened to it. You know, why would you start out, I still have a dream? I can understand saying I have a dream, and then later on, you're saying, I still have a dream. That word still bothered me. Still implied that maybe he had talked about this thing before, or maybe he's had this dream before. Y.T. Walker was on Doc's staff, and he said, we had heard that I have a dream ending about 20, 30 times. We said, Doc, that thing's getting old. You need to change it. About six weeks before, Doc was at Cobo Hall in Detroit, Michigan. That was recorded, and Barry Gordy actually recorded on one of his record labels. And he's got a different speech, but at the end, he's got this very similar I have a dream ending. The night before the march, August 27, 1963, Doc is at the Willard Hotel working on the end of his speech. Here's what I believe. He was gonna have a completely different ending. But something happened the next day while he's doing his, his message. Mahalia Jackson, who's probably one of the greatest gospel singers of her time, if not of all time, was sitting on the stage. And there is footage, you can see her sitting up there, and she's telling him, tell him about the dream, tell him about the dream. Now she had sung for Doc many times, so she probably heard that ending before. And Doc, <laughs> when he's doing his speech, he's looking at his notes. But when he gets to the I have a dream part, he ain't looking at his notes. He's looking around, he's looking away. And uh, you know, had he not changed it, this thing would have been, you know, probably the March on Washington speech, we're marching up to Zion, or, or the big payback. But it would not have been I Have a Dream. And yet, this is the I Have a Dream. And let me just tell you, Mother Jackson, Mahalia Jackson, she's sitting up there, you can see it in the wide footage, She's sitting there rocking. She's waving her arms. She's preaching. Go ahead, go ahead. And she's encouraging him the whole time. And as I said, he, he was, once he got to that part, he didn't need his notes. Clarence Jones, Doc's uh, attorney and speech writer, turned to somebody and said, they don't know it, but he's about to take them to church. <laughs> Listen, if you've never experienced the black church, I'm talking about the music, the preaching, and even the ushers marching, or, or the choir marching in. Listen, 250,000 people were gonna figure out, we're gonna find out what that was all about. And if you look at the wide shot, 
you will see, it's funny to watch because you see Mother Jackson rocking back and forth. Some of these other preachers are sitting there and they got this look on their face like they about to start smiling because they know what's about to happen and they trying, they trying to hold it in, but you can tell it's getting to them. But let me just tell you, it wasn't just, just black folk being moved. There were white folk out there being moved as well. Let me just tell you, truth penetrates the heart and it does not matter who delivers it. And if you have ears to hear, you cannot be dissuaded from the truth. Let freedom ring and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, and we're done free at last, thing, man. thank you know, God Almighty, we are free at last. Around him responded, that whole audience responded. It was an incredible time. And guess what? There was no rioting by those 250,000 participants. And Dr. Ab Abernathy later spoke about how peaceful it was. You know, he talked about a quietness, he talked about the, the wind, a breeze blowing, and he felt as if real change was going to take place in the country. But 18 days later, on September 15th, Sunday, September 15th, 1963, the nation would once again see that this struggle for freedom and liberty would continue. Check out our website at www.jwmhistoryalive.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you want more films, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at John W. McCaskill. This is John W. McCaskill, History Alive.